Y. To you, Dave. I'm Dave Anderson. I direct product development and regulatory affairs for Rainbow. Over the past several years, I have managed Rainbow's Spotted Lanternfly Research Program, working to develop effective and predictable uh, predictable treatment protocols for landscape and tree care professionals. Our current research efforts are focused on looking for pollinator-friendly treatment options. And in addition to this work, I work with the state and USDA officials to support their spotted lanternfly treatment programs. Well, thanks for this opportunity, Dave. And it's a pleasure to share this session with you in this series featuring spotted lanternfly this year. I thought that John Schock from Goods Tree Service provided an excellent overview of spotted lanternfly mitigation from the perspective of a contractor in an earlier session. So I encourage all of you listening and attending to view that webinar for additional background information and to learn about work that is being done in Pennsylvania. This session will provide an introduction to spotted lanternfly, associated damage to plants, the spotted lanternfly's life cycle, and current research. Dave will review specific treatment options and management recommendations as well. A little background on my company, the company I work for, Bartlett Tree Experts. We provide arboricultural services through offices in over 140 locations across the United States, Canada, Great Britain, and Ireland. Our approach is species specific and focuses on safety and science. We have a state-of-the-art research lab and diagnostic clinic in Charlotte, North Carolina, and our headquarters are based in Stamford, Connecticut. Spot and lantern flies are the star of the show today. And these are plant hoppers with, with piercing sucking mouth parts. And these mouth parts, which are called stylids, pierce into the phloem where the turgor pressure of the liquids facilitates uptake. It's like a passive straw. Spotted lanternflies are in the insect order Hemiptera, which also contains aphids, adelgids, and scale insects, and not to mention cicadas. Many of us in the Eastern United States are eagerly awaiting the emergence of brood 10 of the periodical cicada in the next few weeks. A shipment of stone with egg masses from China to a company in Boyertown, Pennsylvania, is thought to be the origin of the spotted lanternfly introduction into North America. And although the insects were discovered in 2014, entomologists believe that they were already present in 2012. The most recent trends in spotted lanternfly population growth, as shown in this map, are driven by human movements of this insect most notably and unknowingly as egg masses. And this has led to regulatory efforts, such as quarantines, spotted lanternfly permits, and inspections to slow the spread of the insect. The geographic expansion from 5,600 square miles in 2018 to over 20,000 square miles in 2020 follows transportation corridors, such as Interstate Highway 81, highlighted in the yellow dashed area more than 60,000 vehicles travel that particular highway every day, of which at least 35% are commercial. Spotted lanternfly continues to move across our landscapes. Distribution maps are updated on a monthly basis and include areas with individual reports, but no establishment. And these are indicated by pink dots on this map. The east to west expansion across Pennsylvania follows the Pennsylvania Turnpike Corridor. And recent infestations include Connecticut, New York, and West Virginia. This expected range map is based on suitable habitat modeling. It's based on elevation and the mean temperature in the driest months of the year and correlates with areas where Tree of Heaven and other suitable hosts are commonly found. We know where spotted lanternfly is now and where it can potentially go geographically. The next question is really, why does it matter? And our primary concern is on commercial agriculture. For example, apples, grapes, hops, and other tree fruit. Spotted lanternflies feed on stems, such as branches and vines. And the diversion of carbohydrates from the plant to the insect has two direct consequences. 
the plant becomes stressed. And in the case of some cultivars of grapes, heavy infestations of spotted lanternfly have resulted in vine mortality due to winter injury, as shown in the lower left image. Insects have to excrete their inputs, and this is in the form of honeydew, a sticky sweet substance. Fungi called sooty mold grow on the honeydew, and this results in a reduction in quality of fruit, such as the apple shown in the lower right corner. Sooty mold growing on leaves will also reduce the availability of a plant to photosynthesize. You know, spotted lanternflies are very hungry. They're feeding on the vine of grapes, not the fruit. As you watch this video, notice the honeydew dripping on the right side of the slide. Hemipterans have a squirt gun effect when they are excreting honeydew. Just imagine standing underneath these vines and getting rained on by honeydew. Aside from sooty mold blocking photosynthesis on leaves, other direct injury has been observed on landscape plants, including branch wilting and leaf drop. And in some cases, branches or even total plants may succumb, typically not to the spotted lanternfly itself, but as a combination of many factors. Stress from the diversion of carbohydrates in trees and production of ethanol resulting from fermentation of sugars in honeydew may result in these secondary pest issues, such as ambrosia beetles, shown in the bottom center of the slide. Sooty mold on the leaves of understory vegetation may cause enough stress through the reduction of photosynthesis to cause mortality. And in the case of poison ivy, this may not be such a bad thing, but it is a problem in terms of understory regeneration in forests. Concerns for property owners include slippery surfaces created by the buildup of sooty mold growing on the honeydew, such as on decks and stairs, disruption of outdoor activities, such as backyard barbecues and picnics are also an issue. Spotted lanternflies are very strong hoppers and the large adults move very quickly. Honeydew is particularly appealing to stinging insects, such as yellow jackets, as they forage in the autumn months for final meals. Most of us are quite familiar with how aggressive those stinging insects can be. Spotted lanternflies have an extensive host species list. In fact, more than 100 different taxa. Nymphs preferentially feed on rose and grape, whereas adults, are most often found feeding on their own native host, tree of heaven, as well as red and silver maples and other trees on the landscape. Quasinoids, limonoids, and juglone are all secondary metabolic compounds produced by trees. And in most cases, these are defense compounds. But it's quite interesting that spotted lanternfly prefer trees that create these metabolites. Very interesting coevolution. Tree of Heaven, also called Ilanthus, is the preferred host species of spotted lanternfly and is also native to China. This is an invasive species most often found growing on disturbed sites, such as right-of-ways. And this is a dioecious tree and females produce prolific seed crops every year. Seeds are wind dispersed and are typically viable. However, as you know, if you've ever cut a Tree of Heaven down, if you do not apply an herbicide to the cut stump, you'll experience a root sucker explosion where once you had a single tree, you will now have 10 or 20. Tree of Heaven is an aggressive colonizer given the chance. We now know that Ilanthus is not required for spotted lanternfly to complete its life cycle. So management strategies are shifting more towards insect intervention and away from reducing the tree population. Spotted lanternflies produce one generation per year. They overwinter in the egg stage in grayish putty-like egg masses with eggs overlapping within the mass like roofing shingles. There are four nymphal instars identified by size and coloration. Nymphs lack wings and they hop and climb to their feeding sites. 
adult spotted lanternflies are easily identified by their size, shape, and their colorful spotted wings. The adult female is larger than the male and the abdomen of the female expands and becomes yellow after mating. And no, spotted lanternflies aren't really as large as the picture shown in the lower left. We can use growing degree days as a guide for developmental life cycle stages. Eggs are present from late September through as late as June. And egg masses are as likely to be found on a cinder block or patio furniture as they are on a tree branch. The first instar nymphs emerge when accumulated heat units called growing degree days reach 240 to 1200, typically between May and June. Using plant phenological indicators, this is when saucer magnolia and quince are in full bloom. The second instar nymph is found in June and July between 600 and 1600 growing degree days. Emergence of the third instar occurs approximately two weeks later, between 1,000 and 1,800 growing degree days. The fourth instar emerges typically between July and September, between 1,300 and 2,200 growing degree days. And the final molt into the adult life stage occurs between 1,700 and 3,200 growing degree days, late July into December. The adults are what we are most familiar with seeing. Eggs are laid beginning in late September. The adults die and the life cycle begins again. Keep in mind that different life stages prefer different host plants. The time of year and the life stage of the insect can help you locate where they are in the landscape. The first, second, and third instars prefer to feed on thin bark species and stems and leaves on hosts such as roses and grape. They insert their smaller, weaker stylets into areas with plenty of sugar and high turgor pressure, such as the midribs of leaves and petioles. Fourth end stars have a stronger stylet and prefer to feed on more woody hosts and plant parts. Adults feed on woody hosts, and you may find them congregating on hosts that drop their leaves later in the season, such as maples. The mortality of adults typically occurs after the first or second hard frost. In autumn, a spotted lanternfly female will deposit two or three egg masses with up to 60 eggs per mass. She lays the eggs in this overlapping roof shingle-like pattern. Eggs are then covered with a waxy white coating for protection. And this dries to a putty or tan gray color and the egg mass looks like a blob of dried mud. Spotted lanternflies lay eggs in unsuspecting places, such as items that are left outside, wheel wells, patio furniture, and firewood. This is why it's extremely important to inspect for egg masses if you're traveling from an area with a known infestation. Adults are aggressive hoppers and will travel long distances on your clothing or inside of your car if you're not careful. Quarantines are in place to prevent the spread of spotted lanternfly. And depending on your location, this may include nursery stock and wood waste from landscaping and arboriculture activities. And permits may be required. The Pennsylvania quarantine order is unique. It contains language such that the property owner needs to take actions to control spotted lanternfly. This could be removing tree of heaven, putting up sticky bands, applying treatments, or any other means to manage the population. I'll now shift to some of the current novel research that's being conducted. Egg masses. Well, they don't hop, they don't fly, so these can be targeted for population reduction. Physically scraping the egg masses off of a surface is often the most effective means of control, but it may not be the most efficient. Removing the egg masses and placing them in a container or a plastic bag and disposing them in the trash, disposing of them in the trash is what is typically recommended. An egg parasitoid wasp 
was discovered parasitizing spotted lanternfly egg masses in Korea, where spotted lanternfly is also invasive. And another wasp, one which also parasitizes gypsy moth egg masses, has also been found on our landscapes. This is very exciting. So research is underway to determine efficacy in the laboratory as well as in the field. The Otis Lab has been conducting field trials for managing egg masses using oils and insecticides. In some situations, oils may be preferred products. I thought you might find some of these results interesting. So this is the setup of their trials, looking at assessments in 2018 and 2019. And the oils in particular are of great interest. If you're not familiar with these, Golden Pest Spray Oil is a soybean-based oil, and Bonide is a paraffinic oil. Dr. Kevin Chase, a Bartlett Tree Research Lab entomologist, my colleague, has field trials underway with different rates of the Golden Pest Spray Oil in Pennsylvania. The use of entomopathic fungi for biological control of spotted lanternfly holds great promise. Bovaria bassiana and Batcoa major are already commercially available as biopesticides. In fact, they're already used to control bed bugs as well as commercial agricultural pests such as aphids. And there are field trials underway in Pennsylvania to determine efficacy with spotted lanternfly. Really exciting opportunities for fungi. And along with parasitoids, and entomopathic fungi, we also have predators, including mantids, a predatory stink, stink bug shown in the lower left image, and eastern bluebird on the right. But my personal favorite biological control method involves managing tree of heaven. And this research has been going on for a number of years, looking at verticillium, which you may be familiar with, if you grow tomatoes, verticillium wilt, or if you manage maple trees on the landscape, so this is a typical unilateral wilting that occurs. But we know that this verticillium, non-alfalfa, can actually infect and result in mortality of tree of heaven. This is still in experimental stages and is not ready yet for large scale or widespread distribution. There's still a few little issues to work out with this, but. Matt Kaysen at West Virginia University has been working with us for a very long time. So exciting news in the realm of biological control. Well, how do we stop spotted lanternfly, or at least how do we deal with it from a practical perspective in the landscape? So researchers at many locations, including Penn State, USDA, University of Maryland, Bartlett tree experts and Rainbow have been conducting research trials trying to figure that out. So working together, several treatments have been identified that are effective at killing spotted lanternfly. Dr. Bittinger and Heather Leach from Penn State conducted spray trials and found that spotted lanternfly are easy to kill with contact sprays. And about the only things that did not work well were spinosad, spirotetramat, and water. When you start looking at residual activity of the contact sprays, however, bifenthrin stands out as the most effective and has been shown to last three to four weeks. For systemic treatments, dinotefuran is the clear winner. And this is a graph from a trial conducted with Dr. Phil Lewis, Lewis from USDA APHIS. Trees were treated with Transtect infusible at the 1.5 milliliter per inch diameter rate, or Transtect as a systemic bark spray at the 12 packets per gallon rate. Tarps were placed under trees, and the number of dead lanternflies were counted. Both Transtect infusible and Transtect as a systemic bark spray provided excellent control against the lanternfly, resulting in thousands 
of spotted lanternflies killed. And here are a few pictures from that trial. On the left, you can see adults feeding and the yeast and mold growing at the base of a control tree. On the right is a picture of the tarp under the Transtect infusible treated tree. And this is only four hours after treatment. That's disgusting. Following up on the excellent control they saw in the trial with Dr. Lewis, in 2020, Rainbow conducted a trial with Dr. Eric Day at Virginia Tech, comparing the standard rate of Transtech as a bark spray and the lowest dose of Transtech infusible of one milliliter per inch diameter. They followed the same tarping method that Dr. Lewis used in the previous trial. And tarps were placed and evaluations began at six weeks after treatment. You can see that both Transtech and the one mil per inch rate of Transtech infusible are highly effective treatments from August through October. So many of the state programs would like to start applications as early as possible. And in 2020, Rainbow conducted a trial with Dr. Steve's, Dr. Jim Steffel on Tree of Heaven to see if early spring treatments with Transtech at the 12 packet rate and Transtech infusible at the one mil per inch rate would last the entire year. So trees were treated in May. And beginning in August, mesh cages were placed around the trunks of the trees. Lanternflies were placed inside cages where they were left for seven days and the percentage of lanternflies that were killed were recorded. The results, results show both Transtect Bark Spray and Transtect Infusible provide control for at least five months. Note that there is high mortality in the untreated control trees. And this is because the spotted lanternflies will wedge themselves in the cage and kill themselves. The current recommendation is to treat in July due to pollinator concerns, but if you do treat in May or in June, the treatments will be effective. Thanks, Beth. Um, now we've viewed the basic background of a spot lanternfly and the research work to kill it. So let's bring everything together and talk about management strategies. Uh, so we got tree, tree removal, egg scraping, tree banding, foliar sprays, and systemic treatments as our options. With, with tree removal, you can't just cut down Tree of Heaven as this will only encourage resprouting from the root system. So you, so you have to apply something like Sightline, which is or triclopyr, to the stump uh, as soon as possible after the tree has been cut. This will prevent that resprouting. Egg scraping involves scraping the egg masses into the alcohol solution as Beth had described. Um, states are handing out these little ID cards that can be used to do this. Um, the problem with the egg scraping is that the majority of the eggs are laid above 10 feet. So this process is very time consuming and not practical for PHC companies, but does provide homeowners and the public with something to do to fight spot lanternfly. Using, using tree bands to trap spot lanternfly is another control option. It works well uh, against the nymphs as they crawl up the trees. You know, they, they'll climb these trees and they, they will fall down on the tree and then they'll climb back up the tree. Um, so this is a great way of capturing the insects. The problem with these sticky traps is that you can catch birds, squirrels, and other wildlife. So if you're going to use sticky traps, cover them with cages um, to, to protect the, um, the non-target animals from getting captured. Foliar sprays are a great way to uh, take out spotlight and flight populations uh, from the the research that Beth had presented, bifenthrin is the best contact kill treatment. Our bifenthrin procs are bifen XTS um, and Upstar Gold. Um, bifenthrin provides the immediate kill and residual control for up to three to four weeks. Um, use this in the spring and early summer to control nymphs and as a, as a quick knockdown for adults later in the season. Uh, you do need to be cautious of spraying flowers so you aren't taking out pollinators or other beneficial insects. 
The USDA treatment program is shifting their efforts towards broadcast spraying of bifenthrin in transportation right of such as railways and distribution centers. Um, multiple sprays will be required that will target adults. Um, the intention is to kill as many spotted lanternfly as possible to prevent spread. The issues with this program are that bifenthrin is a broad spectrum insecticide. So spraying wide swaths of landscape will kill beneficial insects such as bees, butterflies, and predators. Um, the multiple sprays of bifenthrin performed as bifenthrin or as mosquito sprays um, have led to outbreaks of scale infestations. So the belief is that the bifenthrin sprays here um, could kill those the predatory insects and the scale populations um, could multiply unchecked. So similar to mosquitoes, we have the same issues here with the, the spot lanternfly programs. Um, also foliar sprays are the most visible pesticide application methods. So public scrutiny of pesticides sp um, sprays continues to grow. And as a result, the expectation is that there will be significant public opposition to these sprays. And then finally, many times the right-of-way corridors follow waterways, and bifenthrin is highly toxic to fish and other aquatic organisms, so extreme care will be required to ensure the waterways are not impacted by spray or drift. Finally, we have systemic sprays. Uh, Dinotefran is the best systemic treatment for managing spotted lanternfly in trees. Uh, you can see mortality within hours, and it will last all season. Uh, Transtech is our 70% dinotefran formulation. It's packaged in water sale package, packets. Uh, for spot lanternfly is applied as a trunk spray at a rate of 12 packets per gallon. We also recommend adding two and a half ounces per gallon of scrimmage, which is an organosilicone surfactant. And this helps the bark penetration. Uh, the application is sprayed on the trunk from the ground to about four and a half feet high and you apply at a rate of one and a half to two ounces of solution per inch of diameter. The transect moves through the lenticels and then moves systemically throughout the rest of the tree. So it's a great op application method. It's easy to do and it's fast. So you can treat 30 to 40 trees in about an hour. Uh, and because of this, it is the product and application method being used by USDA and state spot lanternfly treatment programs. Specifically for spotted lanternfly, we have special local need registrations for Transtech in several states. Um, for most of these states, the 24C allows applicators to apply up to, up to three times the standard pound per acre restriction. This increases the amount from 0.77 pounds of, active in, or of product to 2.31 pounds of product per acre, or about 20 packets, all the way up to 61 packets now um, per acre. Uh, in New York, it's slightly different. Uh, Transect is not registered for general use, but we do have a 24C registration there that allows for use on Tree of Heaven to control spot lanternfly, as well as for use for hemlock woolly adelgid, elongate hemlock scale, and emerald ash borer. But in New York, it's a little different. Again, we do not have the higher pound per acre allowance, um, so it's simply the standard labeled restriction. Transic Infusible is our newest dinotefran product. It is a 22.5% injectable formulation. Um, and based on the, the research and what Breath presented earlier, we recommend just using one milliliter per inch of diameter for spot lanternfly control. It is ideal for areas near water or where trunk sprays just are not feasible. Uh, it is also a great tool for situations where pound per acre limits are a concern. And one of the tools we have created is the Spotlight Lanternfly Management Guide. This is an awesome reference that provides an overview of spot lanternfly, but most importantly, provides a guidance for landscape professionals on how to recommend treatments for the clients based on their client's tolerance level. <clears throat> Within this guide is a chart that helps determine the client tolerance level. So you have some people that are low tolerance or zero tolerance where they don't want to have honeydew or, or uh, sooty mold on the property, but they don't even want to see spot lanternfly. Um, then you got moderate tolerance people that don't want honeydew or sooty mold on key areas of the property, but it's okay for the spot lanternfly to be present as long as they know their key plants are protected. And then you got the high tolerance people that 
uh, well, the property hasn't really been affected yet by spot lanternfly, but uh, there may need spot treatments uh, for high populations that move in. So for clients um, with low to zero tolerance and when they don't even want the insect present on the property, you want to remove ailanthus or tree of heaven um, and perhaps create some, tr some trap trees for the, with male trees and treat those with transtect. Um, you would begin doing some bifenthrin foliar sprays and monitor for infestations and then reapply if needed. Um, if the property borders wooded areas, you wanna treat the plants along those edges to keep the insects from moving in. You can also consider using those sticky bands. Uh, you will need to rotate those every two weeks or so. And of course, use that cage system to prevent catching any of those non-target animals. Um, and you would apply Transtect or Transtect Infusible to host trees and then reapply Bifenthrin as a trunk spray, a trunk and limb spray in the fall to quickly knock down any populations that would move in. For those people with a moderate to high tolerance um, for spot lanternfly, Treat trees in the high use areas with Transtect. Um, scout highly preferred plants such as roses and spot treat as needed, and then remove and possibly create those trap trees again using Transtect. So let's look at a residential property. Uh, for someone with medium um, to high tolerance, I would treat the trees around the pool, driveway, and sidewalk with Transtect and spot spray populations of spot lanternfly with bifenthrin. This would you know, eliminate that, that honeydew um, that, and sooty mold that might drop onto those areas. <clears throat> For those folks that have low to zero tolerance, treat these areas, but be proactive with preventive bifenthrin sprays around the patio, and then conduct perimeter treatments to keep insects from moving into the area. Then you also remove elanthus and consider creating trap trees in the remote parts of the, uh, of the property. And for a commercial property, the goal is to eliminate the nuisance of the insects and honeydew in high traffic areas. For these types of properties, consider focusing your treatments on parking lot trees, trees overhanging sidewalks, and around the building entrances. The other area to focus on is the warehouse and distribution center. You would need to make sure that the insects aren't hitching rides on the vehicles and the shipments that are leaving this facility. And finally, consider removing all tree of heaven on the property. And if natural or wooded area borders the commercial property, consider treating plants along the edges to achieve greater control. And that's what we got. Any questions? All right, everybody. Let's see here. Thank you so much, Dave and Beth. If you guys want to pop on screen, let's see here. Um, and we can take any questions that you might have at this point. And bear with me just a second here. I manage the technology on my side. Oh, sorry about that. All right, we had some questions coming in, everybody. So I'm just gonna... Patrick, I've got one I can answer. Oh, perfect. So a question from Nathan Burks. And his question is, if we treat with systemics, we wanna make sure we are only treating trees they feed on. And is there a master list of trees that they actually feed on? So to answer Nathan's question, we have definitely sort of the host preferred list, the host specificity, but there really are so many different trees that spotted lantern fly. We'll feed on trees and shrubs, even herbaceous plants. So in the landscape, we focus primarily on maples. These tend to be the hot trees, the silver maple, the red maple. We also find them utilizing birch. But again, being as it is, their host preference is tree of heaven. So that is kind of a quick answer to your question, Nathan. Again, over hundred different uh, plant species that can be fed upon. I would go back to Dave's discussion, which was really focusing on areas in a landscape that are important to the client. Excellent. Well, thanks. And then, so we have another question here. Um, 
Thoughts for municipalities getting ready to deal with spotted and lantern fly. Yeah, I think uh, it was Dave here. Um, for for municipalities getting ready for spotted lantern fly, we'll actually have a talk coming up here, I think another week or two with um, um, Greg Parra from USDA, who will maybe speaking a little bit on this. But uh, it's more about, um, you know, monitoring for the infestation um, and looking for any populations that come in. Um, it depends how far you are away from um, the infestation currently. Uh, but I would be I would be putting trap trees out in some in in common areas, perhaps on roads um, like um, rest stops along highways and things like that. Uh, for Atlanta, it's usually a good spot where they'll be growing and look for those populations to come in and then be ready with a treatment program um finding fine materials you'll need whether you know, the insecticides herbicides you know con contractors you may need to work with those kind of things just be prepared um have a plan in place for um what you'll do once you find it great thanks and then we have a question here can you show the slide again that lists the host species i can do that you're going to, have to give me a second so maybe we can answer oh do you have it there beth Patrick, I have it. Oh, if, well, perfect. Do I have here. permission to share the screen? Let's find out. I'm going to stop share. And then you should have permission to share the screen, Beth. Excellent. So this should show. Everybody's got it. Can see it just fine. Thank you. You're welcome. So then we have a question here. What is being done to assist farmers growing crops? Yeah, um, for this one, I know that um, Penn State has been doing a lot of research on grapes in particular, and David Binger as well with um, like peaches. Um, so there's been a lot of work in those areas. Those seem to be the, the crops that have most interest for the well, attraction to spot lanternfly as well, that the most focused research. A lot of contact sprays. Um, so Penn State's been got a lot of publications on on what they've been, they've got available for this work or for their, available for those treatments. Great. Next question here is when and how do you recommend selling the service in Northeast Ohio? Well, I'll I'll take my approach, and then Dave, you can take your approach. How about that? Sure. Um, <laughs> so I, I think if I were in an area where spotted lantern fly is not present at this time, like Northeast Ohio, so again, uh, not having it there yet, it's time to be mindful of the tree of heaven populations. That would be my preferred approach at this time. And I know we've, we're kind of moving away from that on a broad scale, but if I were looking uh, to discuss this with residential clients, that would be my approach. Yeah, I would agree. Um, be monitoring for it, just make people aware, to, you can be looking for it in their area, but until it's found nearby, I would not do anything. You know, no treatments are required. Great. So we have here, Beth looks like you're already on it. So if SLF focus is on Atlantis, would it be important to treat Atlantis to kill SLF near high value landscape trees? So my answer to that for Glenn is absolutely. And my preferred approach would actually be removal of Atlantis, of Tree of Heaven. And I should tell you why that's not a native plant in our ecosystem. So it's disrupting our ecosystem services simply by displacing native plants. That would be my first preference would be to get rid of that tree. Um, if that is not an alternative, then absolutely you should focus your efforts on using those ailanthus as trap treats and using systemics. So using dinotifuran to kill the spotted lantern fly. Yeah, Excellent. I concur, yep. And then the final question we have here right now is, is transactive animal available for use by homeowners? And I believe we, we do have availability of that. Um, I'm not sure if our website is up for that. Do you know Patrick by chance? Yeah, so um, hypothetically speaking, 
uh, transact uh, can be purchased by a homeowner. However, the way our um, sales operation works at Rainbow is that um, we are trying to just sell to professionals. So if uh, somebody of a homeowner were to call in, they would, um, they would be dissuaded from purchasing Transtech directly from us. Um, there's some other distribution channels where you could purchase Transtech. Um, so they would have to find if there's a local um, marketing partner of ours, uh, they might be able to get it that way. But um, we do, we dissuade um, purchasers of in, purchase, individuals purchasing directly uh, from us. So, excellent. Let's see here. I don't see any other questions right now. We'll give it a second. There is some kind of um, wrap up here that we have for everybody. Um, so we do have, uh, this is part of our, um, I have a question there. We'll get to that question here just in a second. Um, this is part of a greater webinar series, our spring webinar series. And we do have, I believe, um, our second to last SLF webinar on Thursday where we'll actually demonstrate some of these application methods that we spoke about here today. Uh, so please do um, log into that. Um, at the conclusion of this webinar here today, you will be getting a uh, survey. You please could take the time to fill that out. That really helps us to inform us on how we're doing, uh, what else we can be doing. Um, and again, just helping us to better serve the industry. And then finally, uh, for those of you who want pesticide applicator credits in these states, and then we'll get to Tyler's question here. Uh, in the chat right now, um, there are links. So again, if you have your uh, pesticide applicators license in New Jersey and Pennsylvania, there's a link there for you. Um, likewise, if you have a pesticide applicators um, license in Colorado, Wyoming, Montana, and or Utah, um, there is a link there for you. For you, those of you out West, um, you're gonna have five minutes to complete that assessment. So make sure you have all your pertinent information ready to fill out. So obviously your name and your uh, license number ready to fill out before you click on that link because you only have five minutes to finish it from there. Um, if you have any questions, please just type those into the chat. But for our uh, content experts here, Tyler Wright has a question. Um, Agritourism is a large, crop in my county with many local breweries and wineries that bring in revenue to the county. How worried should the county be about this and how should we as foresters and arborists take the issue to elected officials? Go ahead, Beth. Yeah, I'll take it. And uh, Patrick, we are not seeing the links in the chat. Well, dang, let's uh, or, yeah, we probably can now. <laughs> so I want to, and I want to answer Tyler's question. And I also want to answer James had a question in the chat, but for Tyler, so how worried, uh, should you be in your county? So again, I don't know where your county is, but I would tell you that you should be worried. Really, the one of the biggest issues is the impact of spotted lanternfly on grapes. So there is associated mortality with certain cultivars of grapes that are used in winemaking. So I, I think it's really important to bring it to the attention of everyone, including your elected officials. So hops is also a preferred food. So that would be my answer to Tyler's question. Dave, do you want to? Yeah. No, I, I'm right there with you. Okay. And I also want to answer James's question in the chat. He wrote, any idea on how fast spotted lanternfly moves with or adapts to climate temperature rise? So we know that cold temperatures are what kills the adults. And I don't think we have any very good information yet on how the impact of the lowest cold temperatures will be on egg viability after overwintering as egg masses. Some of us experienced some pretty cold winters this year, so it'll be curious to see what we have, again, in South Central Pennsylvania in terms of egg mortality. And although Denver is not on the map for infestations, what we know right now is that spotted lanternfly is traveling mainly through transportation corridors, uh, really through anything. So if somebody's moving from Bucks or Berks County in Pennsylvania out to Denver at a certain time of year when egg masses have been laid on equipment or on patio furniture, that is one way that it could magically appear the following year in Denver. So Dave, any yeah, thoughts and on part that? Part of it's on growing degree days too. It, it's tied, it's connected with growing degree days and all that. So um, that may be why Denver wasn't on there. It might, you know, temperature wise and all that, it may not be conducive for the whole life cycle to complete it. 
Excellent. And then we have another question here. The tree of heaven has become naturalized, and although it once was an invasive, it is now a native. The tree provides many environmental services and should only be targeted if the infestation is discovered. Um, so I'll I'll tackle that um, for Matthew. So we've got a, a couple of different words there. So absolutely, it's, it has become naturalized. So meaning that an organism is not from the original place or not from the place where it's growing now, but it has become um, it's able to reproduce in that area. So I agree, it's become naturalized. Um, and then you've got, although it was once an invasive, I would say it is still an invasive. And any plant, we have native invasive species, we have non-native invasive species, and this would certainly fall in that latter category, the non-native invasive species. So again, just a little bit of semantics, a little bit of terminology. And um, environmental services, sure it does, it captures carbon. But as far as our native insect species and native pollinators go and our native food chain, uh, it's, it's a tree that we have better native alternatives to consider. So I would, um, I would err on the side of let's, uh, let's work with plants that have co-evolved with the insects that we have here on our landscapes. Yep. Excellent. Well, we have some time left, but it does look like we're out of questions. Um, I want to touch a little bit, um, you know, Beth had mentioned about the insects or the adults moving towards, you know, trees that drop their leaves later in the season. Um, typically, this is like red maple. You will find them on red maple when they're laying, a lot of egg masses are found on red maple. Um, in, new infested areas, you'll find the egg mass is starting out in those red maples. So um, keep an eye out on those ma red maples um, when you're looking in a new area. You know. Excellent distinction. Well, all right, once again, it does look like we are out of questions. Uh, hopefully we got everyone's questions answered as it pertains to the subject and of course their CEUs. Um, if you have any additional questions, please feel free to reach out uh, to us here at Rainbow and we'll make sure to get those resolved. Oh, we do have, um, we have one more that popped in here. Um, and so, uh, what is, go ahead, Beth, jump right on it. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So it's um, for Matthew who says, my point was we won't be eradicating the tree of heaven. It is here to stay. I absolutely agree with you, 100%. So, um, but there are places where we can manage it. And that's really my point. And I would say we're not going to eradicate spot lanternfly either. Right. It's past that point. Excellent. It does. Uh, it does make good honey, so just uh, put a personal plug out. If you uh, look for doom bloom honey, I would encourage you to uh, purchase some and give it a try. Thanks for the advice there. That's <laughs> well, excellent. Um, well, I suppose then today we can wrap it up. Um, please feel free to reach out with any additional questions to um, our presenters here today, as well as uh, to our technical support team here at Rainbow Scientific. And um, have a great rest of your afternoon and a great rest of your week. Have a great one, y'all. <laughs>